RC circuits is going to be the topic of this lesson in my new general physics playlist, which when complete will cover a full year of university algebra-based physics. Now in this lesson, we're going to talk about circuits that have both resistors and capacitors, hence the name RC circuits. Uh, we alluded to the fact in an earlier chapter that it takes time for these capacitors to actually reach their max charge, and it's the dynamics of that process that we're going to study in this lesson. My name is Chad, and welcome to Chad's Prep where my goal is to take the stress out of learning science. Now, if you're new to the channel, we've got comprehensive playlists for general chemistry, organic chemistry, general physics, and high school chemistry. And on chadsprep.com, you'll find premium master courses for the same that include study guides and a ton of practice. You'll also find comprehensive prep courses for the DAT, the MCAT, and the OAT. Now, in talking about the dynamics of both the charging and the discharging of a, a capacitor in an RC circuit, uh, I found it instructive to think about a defibrillator. It's an example you're probably somewhat familiar with, hopefully from just the movies or a show or something, uh, and hopefully not in person, uh, but potentially. Uh, but the idea is that the paddles that either the doctor or the first responder or the paramedic or something is holding uh, are functioning as the opposite plates of a capacitor. And it takes some time to charge them. Notice they got to wait for a little bit, and then they say clear, and then they touch it to the, per the patient's chest, and then it discharges. It's kind of completing the circuit so that charge can flow from one plate to the other. So if that's not successful, they've got to wait for a given period of time for them to charge up again as well. So it's a great example of the fact that capacitors take both time to charge as well as discharge. Now, if we take a look, so the, the real diagram of what's going on uh, in an RC circuit for both charging and discharging a capacitor is usually a little more complicated than we give it. So, but it usually involves at least a couple of different switches. And, and, and here, the defibrillator might be the exception because we don't need that second switch because we'll actually discharge it by just touching the patient's chest. But in another capacitor, it's usually not that way. And the idea is this, you've got a couple of switches, and so you can figure out which loop of the, of the circuit here you wanna close. And so the first one I'm gonna close is the one involving the battery here. So we're gonna close that circuit. And in this case, now we've got a complete loop with the source of EMF, the resistor and the capacitor all in series together. So, and current is going to flow from the battery through the resistor, charging up the positive side of the capacitor, leaving the opposite plate negative charge as current continues to flow through the other half of the circuit. So what we'll find is that the current actually flowing through the circuit is intermittent, it's transient. So it turns out it starts at a max, but as as more and more charge builds up on the plates of that capacitor, less and less current's gonna flow until it reaches its max charge. And once it reaches its max charge, all current flow in the circuit stops completely. And at that point, you can actually open back up this switch. And that capacitor will remain fully charged. All right, so let's take this current we used to charge it back off that was transient and is stopped now. And now we're going to close that other switch. And in closing that other switch, we now have a complete loop involving just the resistor and the capacitor. And this charge that's built up on the capacitor can now flow back around the other direction. So until the plates have the same charge once again. So, and it flows right back through that resistor uh, and, and notice the EMF, the battery is not involved in this part of it at all. And this happens until it's fully discharged. Now again, initially we're gonna get current flowing through the circuit until the plates of the capacitor once again have the same charge. And at that point, the current in the circuit completely stops and comes to an end. So that's the charging and the discharging process. And we wanna look at a few graphs as well as some of the math involved in this process because you're probably gonna, in all likelihood, have to do some calculations with it. So. We'll start with the charging process. And if we wanna look at, at the charge buildup uh, on the plates of the capacitor over time, they start out having no overall charge to having a positive plate and a negative plate. So, and in this case, you start off with zero charge and you see it's actually exponentially approaching some maximum value. And if you recall, the definition of capacitance was C equals Q over delta V. And if you rearrange that, Q is equal to C delta V. Now, a couple chapter, chapters ago when we introduced capacitors, we just used this math. So, well, it turns out this is the final result when a capacitor is fully charged. So, but we alluded to the fact that it actually takes some time that we'd study it later. Well, now in this lesson is the later that we alluded to. So it turns out when we calculate this C delta V, that is the maximum charge once it's fully charged. But it takes a little bit of time for that to be possible. And it turns out the resistance of the resistor and the capacitance of the capacitor affect how long it takes. 
the greater their combination of values, the longer it's going to take to fully charge this capacitor. All right, so the max value that we're going to asymptotically approach here is simply equal to C delta V, but we're going to asymptotically approach it, and we've got a rather complex looking equation uh, that gives us a, kind of the value over time. And you take that Q max value and multiply it by one minus some number here. So in this number is an exponential, but it's an exponential to a negative power with time there. And so as time goes up, this becomes e to the negative. Let's say time goes to infinity. This becomes e to the negative infinity. Well, e to the negative infinity is zero, and you end up with one minus zero, and that term goes away, and you just end up with q equals q max at time equals infinity. So the idea that this term is, uh, uh, the limit of this term is going to be zero as t approaches infinity. So ultimately, q is going to approach q max at greater and greater amounts of time. Now here, this negative t over tau, it turns out that tau is what we call the time constant for an RC circuit, and it's simply equal to the product of the resistance times the capacitance. And the greater this is, the longer it's going to take to reach full charge and things of a sort. And the way this works, if you look, so it's a ratio of time over that time constant RC, so in the uh, exponential here, so and ultimately it works like this, it takes about five times the time constant. So to reach max charge. And it turns out that's when you're going to kind of get over 99% fully charged. So if this time constant was equal to 10 seconds, well then it would take 50 seconds to about reach maximum charge. So and you know asymptotically get pretty close to the maximum charge up there somewhere. So that's kind of how it works. All right, so if we look, uh, going back over here, if we rearrange this one more time, we can see that delta V is equal to Q over C. Well, the capacitance is a constant. So, but the delta V is directly proportional to the Q, the charge. And so we shouldn't be surprised that the graph looks exactly the same. So if delta V is proportional to Q, then its graph is gonna look nearly identical. And in this case, we're gonna approach delta V max, which is just, in this case, the EMF of whatever the, the voltage source or EMF source is in this case. So, and again, you see that same term, one minus E to the negative T over tau. And once again, it takes about five time constants to reach the max potential difference across that capacitor. And then finally, we see a graph that looks exactly the opposite. And this is actually the current flowing. So, and if you recall with Ohm's law, delta V equals IR, well, I equals delta V over R. But it turns out that's just the maximum value. And the maximum value is when you first start charging it. But again, once you start building up charges on the positive plate and negative plate, that makes it harder and harder for more charge to flow throughout that circuit to lead to an even greater buildup of charge. And so it asymptotically approaches zero instead. So you start at the max and drop down to zero current. Once it's fully charged, all current stops in that circuit. And so in this case, instead of one minus e to the negative t over tau, it's just times e to the negative t over tau. The entire term is asymptotic asymptotically approaching zero in this case. So that's the charging process. Discharging is similar. So in discharging, it's now fully charged state. So and we're gonna close that other switch and have the current kind of reverse in that second loop going back through the resistor in the opposite direction. So we're starting at a maximum charge. And so in both the case of maximum charge as well as maximum potential difference across that capacitor, they both start at a max and now asymptotically approach zero. And we've seen for something asymptotically approaching zero, instead of one minus e to the negative t over tau, you're just gonna take the maximum times e to the negative t over tau. And again, this term right here is approaching zero, which is why the entire side of the equation here is going to approach zero zero as time approaches infinity. And once again, it's going to take about five time constants or more to kind of get full discharge or something that we say approaches full discharge greater than 99%. So very similar equations. And instead of the one minus e to the negative t of tower, here it's just the Q max or the EMF of the battery, uh, which is the delta V max times e to the negative t over tau. And then notice though, that the current one looks exactly the same. So we saw a difference for charge and delta V. Here, the charge and delta V were going up, here they're going down, but in both cases, both during charging and discharging, the current is going down. When we first closed this switch over here, when this one was open, so we had current flowing to charge up those plates. And as more charge built up on those plates, less current flowed, and so it made sense that it was gonna go down. Well here, now we're actually discharging it and we're gonna have the charge going off those plates, and we have the greatest impetus for that charge to want to flow when it's at a max charge. But eventually this is going to be overall 
back to neutral, no overall charge on those plates, and there's definitely no propensity for current to flow at that point. And so with this one, you actually start at a max and drop down to zero as well. And so that's the one thing that's kind of unique here is that both during charging and discharging, current flow starts at a maximum and goes to zero. So, but we got kind of opposite looking graphs for both, for both charge and the potential difference across the capacitor. Uh, and for here, from here, we're ready to do some plug-in and chug-in. So the question at hand has this lovely circuit here. We've got a 12 volt battery, a 100 ohm resistor, and a 6.0 millifarad capacitor in a circuit here with what's starting out as an open switch. And the question says, for the circuit shown to the right, what is the time constant, first question? What will be the charge stored by the capacitor when fully charged, second question? And what will be the charge on the capacitor, initially uncharged, and the potential difference across the capacitor 1.8 seconds after the switch is closed. All right, so a few questions to answer. And the first is the easy one, just what is the time constant? And time constant tau again is just equal to R times C, which is easy enough in this question. So R times C, which is the 100 ohms, times in this case, six times 10 to the negative three farads. So and as long as I use SI units, ohms and farads, so I had to convert the millifarads to farads, uh, the time constant here is gonna come out with SI units of seconds. So in this case, 100 times six times 10 to the minus three is gonna be 0 0.6, and in this case, it should have two sig figs, so 0 0.60 seconds. And that's our time constant. And if you recall, again, we said the time constant, it takes about five time constants to kind of reach full charge or full discharge in this case. Well, five times that would be about three seconds. So this capacitor to get over 99% charged or discharged, depending on where you're starting from, takes about three seconds. That's something we can just kind of ballpark right off the bat. And so the first question is answered. What is the time constant? The second one is what will be the charge stored by the capacitor when fully charged? Well, again, that's just gonna come right off the definition of capacitance, where Q is just equal to C times delta V. And our capacitor, again, is the six millifarads here. And then delta V is the 12 volts. So, and as long as I'm using millifarads, you guys might recall that this is gonna come out in millicoulombs. So in this case, six times 12 is 72, and so we could write it as 72 millicoulombs, or we could go back and make it like 0.072 coulombs or something of that sort. Uh, really is up to, if it's multiple choice, you know, how the answer choices look and stuff like that. All right, the next question is, what will be the charge on the capacitor, initially uncharged, and the potential difference across the capacitor 1.8 seconds after the switch is closed? We're told it's initially uncharged, so we're doing the charging process. And so here's our two lovely equations here. And so in this case, Q at time T here is gonna equal Q max. And we just solve for Q max. So I'm just gonna plug that right back in. But had we not solved for it, I would just plug in C times delta V again, right into the equation. That's 72 millicoulombs times one minus E to the negative T over tau. So in this case, we're at 1.8 seconds all over 0 0.6 seconds. So, and in this case, we can see that I chose a time that was exactly three time constants. So, and if you look on your, on the study guide here, and I'll put it up on the screen, but uh, three time constants is about 95% fully charged or discharged, depending which way you're going uh, in this case. And so it's gonna come out to be 95% of that 72 millicoulomb number uh, if you wanna check it when we're done. So, but in this case, we'll let the calculator definitely do the heavy lifting here. Um, we've got 72 times parentheses, one minus. So if you look at your natural log button, typically where you get the E button, E to the negative 1.85 divided by 0.65. Oh, and I, I need another set of parentheses there in all likelihood. So E to the negative, I'll insert another parentheses, 1.85 divided by 0.65. And then I've got two sets of parentheses to end right there. All right, we're gonna get 67.819, which rounded to two sig figs would be 68. So 68 millicoulombs here after 1.8 seconds. So that looks right around 95% of 72. So that makes sense. So now we're also asked for the potential difference across the capacitor. And there's a couple different approaches you can take. Had we not already answered this question right here, 
We could then go proceed to this equation right here. We'd use 12 volts for the EMF and do again one minus e to the negative t over tau and life would be good. But again, so from our definition of capacitance here, we know that delta V is equal to Q over C. And so the delta V at any point in time is gonna equal the Q at that time over the C, which is a constant for a given capacitor. And so in this case, because we know the Q at 1.8 seconds, finding the delta V at 1.8 seconds, we're just gonna take the Q value at that same time point and divide it by the capacitance and make our life a lot easier. Again, we totally could use this equation right here. We just don't have to in this case. And so in this case, Q is gonna equal, I'm sorry, let's go delta V is going to equal. That's 68 millicoulombs all over a capacitance of, in this case, 6.0 millifarads. And as long as they're both in millis, they'll cancel and the delta V will come out in volts here. And 68 divided by six, comes out to 11.3, which will round down to 11 volts. And again, that should be effectively 95% of the 12 volt maximum, uh, the EMF on that battery. If you found this lesson helpful, consider giving it a like. Happy studying.